we began a new chapter, the Laplace transform. Uh, I received the midterm course and teaching evaluation for this class. Uh, I was a little bit surprised that uh, the most comments I received said the course is still uh, too uh, difficult and the pace is a little bit fast. So uh, in the uh, rest of the term, I'll try to slow down a little bit so that uh, it hopefully will get uh, easier for you to accept those new knowledge. Uh, but also, as I said, if you have already learned the Fourier transform, uh, then the Laplace transform and Z transform as its extensions uh, will hopefully be not as difficult as the first time when you uh, know Fourier transform. Okay. Okay. So Laplace transform. Uh, it's from the chapter nine of a textbook Oppenheim uh, Wilski. Uh, I recommend you to read the full chapter uh, to understand the background, uh, to understand deeper about the uh, Laplace transform. But first, let's uh, recall the continuous time Fourier transform, uh, which is in this blue box above. It says that if we have a continuous time signal x of t, then we use this formula, uh, taking the integral, then the t will disappear. We get a function capital X of j omega, which is the Fourier transform of x of t. Omega is the frequency. So Fourier transform is actually a representation of the signal x of t in the frequency domain. At this chapter, we will extend the Fourier transform by replacing the variable j omega with sigma plus j omega. So both omega and the sigma are real numbers. Therefore, the j omega is a pure imaginary number. Right? J is the imaginary operator, j square equals minus one. And the sigma plus j omega is a complex number with both real part sigma and the imaginary part omega. So the same formula, if we replace j omega with sigma plus j omega, the right hand side, the same replacement occurs. Yeah, then the question is why we, why we need this replacement? So this replacement actually leads to the uh, definition of Laplace transform. So where is it useful? So first, let's understand this replacement, uh, this extension uh, from a uh, intuitive illustration. Uh, originally, the Fourier transform is defined on the uh, uh, imaginary number j omega. So if we plot those numbers on the real and the imaginary uh, plane, in other words, in the complex plane, then j omegas are on the vertical axis. So this blue vertical axis. But if we extend to sigma plus j omega with the real part of sigma that can be non-zero, then we extend from the vertical axis to the entire sigma and omega plane, to the entire 2D complex plane. This is intuition of the extension from j omega to sigma plus j omega. So the sigma, so what is sigma? Sigma is just a, um, it's just the real part of a complex number S. So our purpose is to extend from J omega to a general complex number S. So sigma is the real part of that complex number where sigma can be non-zero because previously with J omega only, it has zero real part. So sigma is, a real part that can be zero or non-zero in this chapter. Okay, then the Laplace transform is defined as a integral over time t, x of t exponential minus st, right? because from the last page we defined sigma plus j omega as s, so this is s. And similarly on the left hand side, sigma plus j omega equals s. So after taking this integral, we have a function of s. This function of s is called the Laplace transform 
of x of t. So it's Laplace transform basically takes the same format as the Fourier transform, but instead of j omega, it is a general complex number s here. Okay. So up to now, I only introduced to you what is Laplace transform, but I haven't explained why we need Laplace transform. So the first, let's look at where can uh, uh, where Laplace transform can be useful. Its main application is still in the LTI system, a continuous time LTI system, linear time invariant system. Uh, given input x of t, we want to calculate y of t. And this chapter, we focus on the particular kind of x of t, which is complex exponential signal, exponential s of t, where t is the time variable, s is a uh, general complex number. So recall that in last chapter, when we studied Fourier transform, we have, we consider input exponential j omega t. Uh, this chapter, we consider exponential s t, where s is a complex number. So, but regardless of what kind of input we are considering, the y of t is always the convolution between h and x, where h the, is the unit impulse response of the unit impulse response of the LTI system. Uh, this is what we learned from chapter two, LTI system. And the definition of continuous time convolution is an integral over time tau. So tau appears up everywhere. And the, but the result of this integration should be a signal of t. Therefore, there must be a parameter t inside it, which is not, the t is not the integral variable. Tau is the integral variable. And since we consider this particular x of t, and then x of t minus tau replace t with t minus tau, we have exponential s t minus tau. So exponential s t minus tau. H of tau exponential that that contains tau d tau. And we just leave everything related to tau inside the integral, right? H of tau exponential minus s tau d tau. But this exponential s t, since it's not relevant to tau, we can extract it outside of the integral. Then what is inside the integral? Uh, this uh, blue part is the Laplace transform of small h, right, by this definition. So if we replace x with small h, then capital H is its Laplace transform. So small h, capital H, which is a function of s. So in last chapter, we learned that if input is exponential j omega t, then we have system frequency response, uh, the frequency response of the LTI system, which is the Fourier transform of small h. So j omega everywhere. But the, this chapter, again, as I said, we replace j omega with s. It's an extension from pure imaginary number to complex number. How to find a sigma? So I got this question from the chat window. Uh, the sigma is not something that uh, that need you to find. Sigma is just the uh, variable. It's just the variable domain that we are considering. Just as in the Fourier transform, when we say we get the Fourier transform h with j omega, it's just a function of omega. Uh, we, we don't have the question how to find omega. So the entire last chapter, the purpose, the task is to obtain is to calculate a function h of j omega. So omega is the variable of that function. At this chapter, our purpose is to obtain a function of general complex number s, where s is a variable. Since it's a complex variable, this variable has is composed of two variables, actually. The real part sigma and imaginary, imaginary part omega, which are both variables. And we don't need to find them. 
that are just our variables. Okay. So to summarize for LTI system, if input is exponential st, then the output is exponential st multiplies this function capital H of s, where capital H of s is the Laplace transform of the system unit impulse response small h. And we learned in chapter two, if you still remember, or you can check back the slides in chapter two, this exponential s of t is called an eigenfunction of the LTI system. H of s is the corresponding eigenvalue. It's the eigenvalue correspond to a particular complex number s. So the input x of t, which is exponential s of t, is this kind of sigma. Since s is sigma plus j omega, so exponential sigma t times exponential j omega t. It has two parts, real part, imaginary part. We can spread it as uh, according to the Euler's formula. So both real and uh, imaginary parts have similar structures. So we only look at the illustration of the imaginary part, exponential sigma t psi omega t. If sigma equals zero, exponential sigma t is one. So we're just looking at psi omega t, a, sinusoid, a standard sinusoidal sigma. When sigma larger than zero, upon this sinusoidal oscillating signal, there is a magnitude that is increasing over time t. So as we can see, sigma omega t is increasing, uh, is uh, oscillating while its magnitude is increasing. And when sigma less than zero, exponential sigma t is decreasing over t and diminishes to zero as t goes to infinity. And this decreasing function limits the magnitude of oscillation of psi omega of t, so which is plotted in this way. Okay. So what's the difference of the function between Fourier transform and Laplace transform? So the, what, what, what are the different uh, functions of them? Actually, uh, yeah, I will, I will explain it in uh, shortly, in a few slides actually. But first, let's, uh, let's finish this, uh, this part that relates Laplace transform with a LTI system. Then I'll explain why for LTI system, the Fourier transform is not enough, but we, still, we also need Laplace transform. So we just considered x of t being the exponential st, but for general x of t, how can the Laplace transform be useful? So for general x of t, this relationship still hold. Y of t is the convolution of h and x. So this always holds. And then if you consider the Laplace transform of output y of t, so denoted by capital Y of S, uh, uh, evoking the, uh, the definition of uh, Laplace transform, small y of t, exponential minus S t dt, so integration over t so that it's a function of S. And then y of t, since it is the convolution of H and X, we replace the y of t, we replace the red part with the definition of convolution. Right? This is the standard definition of convolution between H and X. The convolution itself is also an integral, but it's an integral over tau. And the result is time t. It's a signal of time t. Okay. And then we change the last term in the integral a little bit. It's exponential minus S t. We write it as exponential minus S t minus tau. And there is additional exponential minus s tau so that the equality still holds. So what's the purpose of, the, of rewriting this term, of splitting this term? We can put exponential minus s tau together with h tau. 
we can put exponential minus s t minus tau with x of t minus tau. And inside this integral, there are d tau and dt. So d tau is put together with all the functions with tau. And dt is put together with all the functions with t, but we change it as t minus tau. Because here, dt equals d of t minus tau. Right, we have to, so t is the uh, variable, time variable that is changing. And inside of this integral, since t is the integration variable, then we can add a minus tau to it without changing the result integral because minus tau for this integral, minus tau is just a constant. Or then let me explain it uh, further. We have two integrations. The first, the red integration is with respect to tau. So that's where we put first is with respect to d tau. The second, the black integration is with respect to t. That's why we put a second with dt, but the tau here is a constant for this black integral. And one thing to notice that the second integral, the result is irrelevant to t minus tau. It's the result is just related to s, right? Because t minus tau is the variable for the second integral. Or we can more explicitly redefine t minus tau, substitute with one variable, r. So substitute t minus tau with r, substitute t minus tau with r, substitute dt minus tau with dr. And since we are doing the substitution, the integration limit also need to be transformed because originally the integration limits are taken with respect to minus infinity to plus infinity. If it is with respect to t, now we are considering r, which is t minus tau. So the integration limit is minus infinity minus tau plus infinity minus tau. And it's still minus infinity plus infinity, but what is left is just a integration over r, over the new variable r. And the first term is straightforward, right? h tau exponential minus s tau d tau is the standard definition of Laplace transform. So the first term is just h of s, the Laplace transform of small h. And the second term, x of r, although the integration variable is r, but it does not change the result of integral. If we replace r with tau or replace r with t for every r. And it says, again, the standard definition uh, of Laplace transform for small x, so capital X. question is, how exists in the second integration? Why we can take the terms out? Mm, okay, let me think how to explain that. So one way to explain it is the following. Uh, the red, let's say the red integration we we'll always remember that the red integration is taken with respect to tau. So it should contain, it should encapsulate everything related to tau, including the second integration. So the second integration is in principle inside the first integration, but I just write it last. But after we change, after realizing that dt and dt minus tau are the same, and after realizing that we can replace t minus tau with a new variable that is irrelevant to tau, we can further split it, split the second term outside of the red integration. So you can understand as a, as a particular structure that 
facilitate us to make something that was originally inside the integral to a separate integral. Okay. Okay. Ah, the detail, I just write detail here. So as I said, in principle, we should write h of tau exponential minus s tau, then the everything inside the black integral and then d tau. I just write d tau first, but I, I write d tau first, but in principle, the second integral should be inside the first integral. And then after changing the dt to dt minus tau and replacing t minus tau with r, we can split, we can completely split out. Okay. But the result is y of s, the Fourier transform of y equals h of s, the Fourier transform of the unit impulse response, times capital X, the Fourier transform of input X. So we have these three figures describing the behavior of an LTI system in different variable domains. In the time domain, we know that it's the first figure, the convolution. In the frequency domain, continuous frequency omega, we know that the Laplace tra the Fourier transform, capital Y of J omega, is capital H J omega times capital X J omega. This is what we learned in the last chapter, the Fourier transform. And what we just derived in the last slide is that if you take the Laplace transform of both input output, then capital Y of S is H of S times X of S. Therefore, the Fourier transform is actually a special case of a Laplace transform because S is a general complex number. It can have both real and imaginary part. If we consider a special case where the real part is zero and S is a pure imaginary number J omega, then it is the description of for LTI system in terms of Fourier transform. Then the question comes up. Why not, why we, why not we just deal with everything with the Fourier transform? So what, why we still need the extension to Laplace transform? Okay. So here are some two examples to motivate the Laplace transform. Let's consider this signal X of T exponential minus T U of T. Uh, let's calculate its Fourier transform. And we know from last chapter that Fourier transform is a signal multiplies exponential minus j omega t dt. The integration should be taken over minus infinity to plus infinity. But because of this step signal u of t, everything less than zero is actually zero. So we only need to take the integral from zero to plus infinity. And on, in this range, x of t is just exponential minus t. So exponential minus one plus j omega t, we pull it outside of the integral, then there needs to be this coefficient on the denominator, which is okay because it's non-zero, right? This real part is always one, it's non-zero. We take its lower upper limit. The lower limit, uh, the, the lower upper bound, the lower bound is simple. Just replace t with zero, then the result is one. The upper bound, if we take the limit of this exponential as t goes to plus infinity, we focus on its magnitude. So exponential minus t is its magnitude. As t goes to plus infinity, this magnitude diminishes to zero. So the upper bound is zero when t equals, when t goes to plus infinity. Then the result is one divided one plus j omega which is the Fourier transform. So this tells us that for this signal X of T, this Fourier transform exists. Or we, we always say it's Fourier transform. We also say it's Fourier transform converges. It converges because this limit converges. But this is not always the case. Not every, not every continuous time signal have a Fourier transform. 
for example, this signal. So the difference between this signal and the signal on the last page is that it's exponential t instead of minus t. Then we try to calculate its Fourier transform using the same procedure. Still, the integration is from zero to plus infinity, exponential t, exponential minus j omega t dt. And what we have is one minus j omega as the coefficient in front of t. So one minus j omega on the denominator as well. We try to calculate the difference between zero and plus infinity. Zero is a simple case, but plus infinity, we have a problem. The magnitude of this complex exponential is exponential t. As t goes to plus infinity, the magnitude goes to plus infinity. No, actually, I should, I should say its magnitude goes to plus infinity. And therefore, this integration does not converge. And we cannot calculate a finite Fourier transform for this x of t. We just say Fourier transform for this signal does not exist or it does not converge. And for this kind of signal where Fourier transform does not work, we need Laplace transform. So this introduces our first uh, exercise Exponential minus a t times step signal u of t is a general case for the two examples we look at above because we are considering any real number a where a can be positive, zero, or negative. When a is negative, then it actually corresponds to this case, right? In this case, a equals minus one. When a is positive, it corresponds to this case, a equals one because we are looking at exponential minus a t. But then for your practice, first you try to apply the standard formula, calculate the Fourier transform of this signal. So I'll give you two minutes and then we'll look at the answer. Okay. The Laplace transform of the signal, the standard formula exponential minus a t u of t here, exponential minus s t dt taking integral over t. Because of this step signal u of t, we only keep the part from zero plus infinity because everywhere less than zero, everywhere t is less than zero, the uh, signal is just a zero. The integration uh, is nothing. And on this region, we have exponential minus a t times exponential minus s t. So we can all uh, put a and s together, exponential minus a plus s of t. And pulling it outside of the integral, minus s plus a, so on the denominator, on the numerator, we're taking the difference between zero and plus infinity. So for uh, zero, for t equals zero, the result is just one. And then the focus is to 
take the limit t equals plus infinity of this term exponential minus s plus a. So we put lower bound first, the upper bound second, so that there is additional minus sign cancels the minus sign on the denominator. And then next, let's discuss the limit as t equals to plus infinity. S is a complex number, so we write it as sigma plus j omega, but sigma is its real part, j omega is its imaginary part. This limit is, so we just replace S with sigma plus j omega, same limit. This limit has, so what's it, after the limit symbol is a complex number, its magnitude is minus sigma plus a t. Its angle is given by exponential minus j omega t. So in other words, minus omega t is its angle. So here we discuss the limit in three cases, sigma plus a, whether it's positive, zero, or negative. When it is positive, the magnitude exponential minus sigma plus a t goes to zero when t goes to plus infinity, right? If this sigma plus a is a negative number, is a positive number. So for the first case, the limit is just zero. For the second case, sigma plus a is zero. Then it is this term, the first term becomes one. We are taking the limit for exponential minus j omega t, which does not exist because we know that exponential minus j omega t both its real and the imaginary part are sinusoidal signals that are, const that, are constant, that, that are oscillating at a constant magnitude. And such a constantly oscillating signal does not have limit. And when sigma plus a less than zero, then minus sigma plus a is positive. So exponential, a positive number times t as t goes to plus infinity, the magnitude will ramp up to infinity as well. So the limit does not exist either. It's just plus infinity. There's no finite limit. That's the discussion of this limit for different cases of sigma plus a. Therefore, if and only if sigma plus a is positive, the first case, we have this limit equal zero. Otherwise, this limit does not exist. And substitute this result back to the calculation of Laplace transform. Only if, only if sigma plus a larger than zero, we have the Laplace transform, which is one minus the limit zero. Right, this limit is zero for this case, one minus zero, s plus a, which is one divided by s plus a. So, this limit only exists when sigma plus a larger than zero. In other words, sigma larger than minus a, but what is sigma? Remember that sigma is the real part of s, so the real part of s larger than minus a. To summarize the result is, the Laplace transform of the signal exponential minus a t u of t is the simple uh, fraction as one divided by s plus a, but this, only holds when the real part of S is larger than minus A. Outside of this region, outside of this real part S larger than minus A, the Laplace transform does not exist because one critical limit during the calculation of integral does not exist. So later I will show the result in a more uh, intuitive way on the figure. But at this point, let's look at another exercise that is related to the last one. We have a different signal. So the last signal is exponential minus a t u of t. And for this signal, we add two minus signs. The first minus sign at the beginning, the second minus sign is u of t, we change it to u of minus t. Again, the real number A can be positive, zero, or negative. The result is, will be the same. And try to calculate its Laplace transform using the formula. Uh, two minutes for exercise.
So before we look at answer for this one, let me try to answer a few questions on the chat window. Uh, S depends on sigma and uh, omega. So the, the domain is, yes, the domain of uh, Laplace transform is 2D. So later we will always plot the, say the region where Laplace transform exists in a 2D uh, plane. A, the sigma looks like a six. Uh, I, I'm sorry for that. Is uh, is so. Hopefully, it will not cause confusion. It's a sigma. Always a sigma. It's not six. Okay. For this signal, we apply the same procedure of calculating Laplace transform, but because u of minus t is the reflection of u of t on the time axis. So it's one when t takes value from minus infinity to zero. It's zero when t is positive. Therefore, it, uh, it uh, keeps the integration on the region where t is negative. That's why the integration is taken from minus infinity to zero. On this region, we have the signal as exponential minus at. Don't forget this minus sign here at the beginning. Multiply with exponential minus stdt is the Laplace transform. Try to calculate in the integration minus s plus a on the denominator, exponential minus s plus a of t on the numerator. And again, we are encountering this problem of calculating the lower bound as t goes to minus infinity, what is the limit of this term? The upper bound is just t equals one exponential equals one. Uh, sorry, t equals zero exponential equals one. And the two minor signs cancel each other, so we have s plus a. Okay. Uh, well, one thing to notice that here we write s plus a on the denominator. A is a real number. S has a real part sigma plus a. So we need to be careful that sigma plus a cannot be zero right, in this case. But because of later discussion, sigma plus a equals zero, this case is excluded from our result anyway. So excluding sigma plus a equals zero also excludes the possibility that the denominator is zero, so we are okay. That's just a remark about the denominator being zero, being non-zero. Again, we consider S with as the uh, sigma plus j omega and discuss the limitation of this complex number. Its magnitude is exponential minus sigma plus a t. Its angle is minus omega t. So again, when sigma plus a is positive, because t here goes to negative infinity, so we have a minus sign minus infinity, so minus t is positive infinity. Sigma plus a is positive, then this exponential goes to positive infinity, positive infinity. In other words, the limit does not exist. Then when sigma plus a is less than zero, we know that the limit must be zero. It must be diminishing as t goes to minus infinity. And in between with sigma plus a equals zero, we are again looking at a signal oscillating at a constant magnitude whose, is, whose limit does not exist. So the result, which has a very similar structure with the last example, only when sigma plus a is negative, this limit exists and it equals zero. Otherwise the limit does not exist. So only when sigma plus a less than zero, the Laplace transform exists, which is one minus the limit zero s plus a, which is again one divided by s plus a. But this time the condition for this to hold is sigma mi less than minus a. In other words, the real part of s less than minus a. Real part of s less than minus a. So we summarize the result um, by showing it on this figure. 
The first example we look at is this signal, exponential minus a t u of t. Its Laplace transform is one divided by s plus a, only existing on real part of s larger than minus a. So let's look at the signals and its Laplace transform more carefully. The signal, it has u of t, which is step signal. So everything left to the vertical axis is just zero. Everything to the right of it is exponential minus a t. We consider the case. So on this slide, we only consider the case a positive. So next slide, we will consider a negative. When a is positive, exponential minus a t is a decaying signal over t. It's diminishing as t goes to infinity. And for this signal, its Laplace transform only exists on the region where real part of s larger than minus a. Because a is a positive, then minus a is a negative real number. If we plot it on the imaginary plane, it is on the real axis, it is negative. So the Laplace transform only exists on the region where real part larger than minus a. It is the red region. It's called the region of convergence, ROC, for this Laplace transform. Here, the minus a, the point minus a, is called the pole of x of s. So this point is called the pole. And a general definition of a pole is a point that makes the denominator zero, right? s plus a, if you want to make it zero, then s equals minus a. Therefore, minus a is called the pole of this fraction x of s. And there are some uh, relationships between the structure of x of t and its Laplace transform. x of t is a so-called right-sided signal because it is zero on the left. It only it is only non-trivial on the right, so we call it right-sided. Then it's kind of a coincidence that the ROC of the Laplace transform is also on the right of the pole. So I highlight the right and the right. It's some result that is that make it convenient for you to memorize. If the signal is right-sided, then the ROC is also on the right because we have larger than minus a on the right. And also the signal is, if you take the integral of this signal, so x of t, we can take its absolute value. Although in this special, in this particular example, x of t and its uh, absolute value are the same. But if we take the integral of its absolute value, we know that this integral is finite. When this integral is finite, on the Fourier on the Laplace transform, we can notice that the region of convergence contains the vertical axis, right? Vertical axis falls inside the region of convergence. So what is the vertical axis? The vertical axis is the axis where the real part of S is zero. It only has an imaginary part, so S equals J omega because sigma equals zero, so s equals j omega. When s equals j omega, we know that this kind of transform is the Laplace transform. And we know that this vertical axis, s equals j omega, falls inside the region of convergence. In other words, the Laplace transform when s equals j omega converges. The Fourier transform. So, so when s equals j omega, it, it's a Fourier transform. Fourier transform is a special case of a Laplace transform. The Fourier transform exists. So as you will see later, when the integration of the time domain signal is finite, then the Fourier transform exists. It holds for most of the, for most of the signals, although it requires some mathematical condition, additional mathematical conditions, but in this 
course, we assume those conditions always hold. So we simply say when the integration of x of t of a solute value is finite, then its Fourier transform exists. This is actually a general law that can be validated later, later by other examples. Okay. Let's have a break and come back at uh, 12.30 uh, to uh, resume the lecture. Right, the region of convergence does not cover the point minus A itself. So the, that's why I, uh, I plotted with a dashed line, it does not contain the line itself. Actually, the next slide, so this first slide, the second slide, we are looking at the same function and therefore the Laplace transform and its uh, region convergence the same. Right? If you compare these two slides, the first line is all the same. The difference is we are illustrating the case when A is negative. When A is negative, exponential minus A T is increasing over time T, right? A is negative minus A is positive. That's why it's increasing. X of t is still right-sided because to the left, it is zero. Therefore, the ROC is still to the right of minus a. ROC is also on the right. But this time, the point minus a is on the right of the vertical axis because a is negative, minus a is positive. It's a positive real number. Then the ROC does not contain the imaginary axis. In other words, the real part of S equals zero or equivalently S equals J omega is not contained in ROC. So if we, even if we try to write X of S as X of J omega, try to write it as a Fourier transform, but that Fourier transform does not converge or it does not exist. And indeed, you will find that a general uh, connection between X of T and the existence of its Fourier transform is that if the integral of magnitude of X of T over all the time T is infinite, then the Fourier transform does not exist. Why is this integral infinite? Because if you look at this, X of T itself goes to infinity. And if we look at its integral over time T, the area covered by this function, of course, the integral is also infinite. So if integral is infinite, the Fourier transform does not exist. But the existence of Fourier transform, the direct criteria is looking at the plot of ROC. If the ROC does not contain the imaginary axis, then the Fourier transform does not exist. The first of the two slides are looking at the function exponential minus a t u of t. Then the next slide, we look at a different function. This function is from exercise two that we did above. Right? It has a u of minus t. Because u of minus t is the time reflection of u t, so this time the signal becomes left-sided. On the left, let's consider the case a negative first. A is negative exponential minus a t is exponential some positive number t is increasing. It should be decreased, it should be increasing above the horizontal axis. But because of this additional minor sign at the beginning, we flip it below or mirror it with respect to the horizontal axis. Then the increasing function, imagine that there is increasing function and then we Reflecting it below, it becomes what you see here. This is the plot of X of T. Again, it is left-sided signal and the integral of its absolute value is finite, right? Because it decays to zero and this, the region of this, uh, so the, the, the area of this region is finite. For this kind of X of T, 
the result of exercise two. So we look at the result of exercise two. It is still this fraction, but real part of S is less than minus A. Still one divided by S plus A, real part of S less than minus A. It's this region of convergence, ROC. A is negative, minus A is positive. Then ROC is to the left of minus A. We can see the connection same to the two slides above. If it's a left-sided signal, then the ROC is to the left. The last two slides say, if it is right-sided, the ROC is to the right. right. You can clearly see this correspondence. And this ROC contains the imaginary axis. In other words, when real part of S equals zero, S equals J omega, the Laplace transform becomes a special case Fourier transform. And this special case Fourier transform exists because it is inside the ROC of Laplace transform. Again, we can see the same connection. If the integral of X of T magnitude is finite, then the Fourier transform exists, right? If it's infinite, does not exist. If it's finite, exists. So the three slides says the same connection. Then there is a fourth slide that discusses the same signal and the same Laplace transform as the last page. But if you look at the case A positive, a negative is an increasing signal. Uh, well, it's increasing when T increases. The A is positive, it's decreasing when T increases. So this is the plot when A is positive. Again, it is a left-sided signal. The ROC is to the left of minus A. Minus A this time becomes a negative number because A is positive. And the Integration of x of t magnitude is infinite because the area covered by this, uh, the, the area of this region covered by x of t is definitely indefinite. So uh, it's uh, obviously inf uh, infinite. Then the same correspondence, the same connection as the last few slides tells us that. Fourier transform does not exist for this case. And the direct criteria or the direct evidence that Fourier transform does not exist, as we can see from the plot of ROC, the imaginary axis is out of ROC, which means if S is imaginary number J omega, the Laplace transform, which becomes Fourier transform, does not converge or does not exist. So here we can see the connection between uh, the structure of ROC and the structure of X of T and the connection between existence of Fourier transform and the structure of X of T. And again, let me emphasize later in your exercise exam problems, if you encounter the question whether the Fourier transform exists or not, the direct evidence is to is whether the imaginary axis is inside or outside of ROC. If it's inside ROC, Fourier transform exists. Otherwise, Fourier transform does not exist. Let's look at some uh, more complicated exercises to uh, consolidate our understanding of this tool Laplace transform. The first one, let's look at this signal. Exponential minus 2t times cosine 3t times u of t. And I will give you three minutes because this is a little bit hard one. Applying the standard definition of Laplace transform, don't forget to point out its region of convergence, ROC, for Laplace transform. And the hint here is because it contains cosine, we had similar exercises before. Convert cosine to exponential j3t plus exponential minus j3t divided by two to calculate, to facilitate the calculation of integration. Okay. 
I will show the answer after three minutes. Okay. Oh, it's a very long calculation. So let's uh, look at the procedure step by step. The standard formula X of S equals X of T exponential minus S T dt integration taken over positive to plus infinity. X of t is exponential minus 2t cosine 3t times ut. But here we don't want to write the ut. Then we need to apply ut to shrink the integration uh, interval from plus infinity. So from minus infinity to plus infinity, we change it to from 0 to plus infinity because of the u of t. And then we replace cosine 2t using Euler's formula, exponential j3t plus exponential minus j3t divided by 2. So one half extracted before the integration, integration from 0 to plus infinity, is split as two terms. The first term is minus 2t j3t minus st. So minus two j3 minus s, organize the coefficients together with t dt. The second term, don't forget this one half. So the second term is minus two t minus j3 t minus s t. So minus two minus j3 minus s t dt. Look at those two terms separately. The first term, we put the coefficient minus s minus two plus j3 on the denominator. On the numerator is this exponential taking difference between zero to plus infinity. The same structure for the second term, but the difference from the first term is that we change plus j3 to minus j3, right? plus j3 to minus j3. And when calculating the limit as t goes to plus infinity, what we focus is on minus s minus two, because we know that j3 or j3t is just a imaginary part that affects the phase angle of the exponential. What impacts the magnitude of the exponential is the real part of minus s minus two. So the real part of minus s minus two is what affects the magnitude of this whole exponential. And it's also what affects the limit as it goes to plus infinity. But in particular, when the real part of minus s minus two 
is negative. So as I wrote here, when the real part of minus s minus two is negative, the exponential minus s minus two t goes to zero when t goes to plus infinity. So only when this case, we can replace the first term, we can replace the limit as a zero. And similarly for the limit in the second term, because the second term minus s minus two is still the same as the first term. So still the same condition, real part of minus s minus two less than zero. Then as t goes to plus infinity, the limit is zero. And then minus one, minus one, because it's when t equals zero, exponential zero is one. And the denominator just copied down without any change. We can eliminate the negative, the negative signs, and we can merge the denominator. So the two denominators multiplying each other, and then they are added up on the numerator. As a result, on the numerator, the J3 and the minus J3 cancel each other. What we have is two times S plus two. But because of this one half, don't forget this one half during the entire process, then the numerator becomes S plus two. On the denominator, it is S plus two square minus J square times nine because j squared is minus one, so it becomes plus nine. So this is the result after some simplification. Again, it requires the real part of minus s minus two less than zero. In other words, the real part of s should be larger than minus two. If we put real part of s on the right-hand side of this inequality, right? real part of s larger than minus two. So if you plot this ROC, you will see that the ROC is to the right of the point minus two. It is consistent with the observation that X of T with a standard step signal U of T inside is a right-sided signal. It is zero everywhere to the left of zero and it is exponential minus two T cosine on the right of T equals zero. And it is okay if you leave your answer in this way. I mean, in homework and exams, it's okay to leave it in this way, but at least you need to calculate the integral. Fin you need to finish the calculation of integral. Right? This is a still intermediate step of integral. You need to at least get this result. Okay. We have a similar example. Uh, so I will just show the answer. We change cosine 3t to sine 3t. We denote the signal by y of t, so to differentiate it from x of t. Uh, then we can go much quicker with this one. Uh, exponential minus 2t sine 3t exponential minus sd dt because we don't have a u of t in this step, then we have to shrink the integration uh, interval of starting from zero. And sine 3t applying Euler's formula is exponential j3t minus exponential minus j3t divided by 2j. Don't forget it's 2j, not 2. And the first and second term both contains coefficient one divided by two j. And the inside of the exponential, the difference is plus j3 versus minus j3. Again, when calculating the integral, in particular when calculating the limit as t goes to infinity, the limit takes zero if and only if the real part of minus s minus two less than zero. So this is the same as the last example actually. And we get this result. Uh, the 
difference, the key difference is that on the numerator, when we try to simplify it, on the numerator, we have s plus two plus j3 minus s plus two minus j3. So the result is j times six. Divided by this coefficient two j, we have three on the numerator. And denominator is still the same as the last example. And the ROC is also the same, real part of s larger than minus two. So just summarizing the results of the last two examples, exponential minus two t cos sine three t u of t is Laplace transform is this one. And for sine three t, the Laplace transform is this one. Both, both have the same denominator and numerator are different. And both have the same ROC. If you plot this ROC, it's in this, it, it, it's here, minus two, here, the ROC does not contain minus two, so I put a cross here. It means does not contain minus two. It does not contain the vertical axis that passes minus two, so that this axis, so the vertical line passing x minus two. Therefore, I plot this vertical line uh, with dash line. It means does not contain this line because it's strictly positive. And one thing to notice is that this region of convergence contains the imaginary axis where s equals j omega. Therefore, for both the signal above x of t and the signal below y of t, the Fourier transforms also exist. And the Fourier transform just replacing s with j omega. This is Fourier transform. By replacing s with j omega, replacing s with j omega, the Fourier transform exists. Okay. So this is a Fourier transform related to exponential and sinusoidal signal. Uh, sorry, the Laplace transform related to this kind of signal. Now let's look at another example. Delta of t. Just a continuous time standard unit impulse signal. Try to calculate its Fourier transform, indicating the region of convergence according to the standard formula. So let me emphasize that for problems associated with Laplace transform, always don't forget to indicate the ROC, region of convergence. If we apply the standard formula, delta of t exponential minus s t dt, so we know how to calculate this kind of integral, just exponential minus s t, t takes value where the impulse occurs. The impulse occurs at zero, so replace t with zero, exponential minus s zero equals one. And actually, when calculating this result, we 
are not restricted to any particular region of S. Therefore, this result holds for all the S. If plotted, it is an entire complex plane. Of course, it contains the imaginary axis, J omega. And therefore, the Fourier transform exists. If we replace S with J omega, as a special case, we obtain a Fourier transform, which is also one, because the result does not contain S. So the same result one for all the omega, for all the frequency omega. And this result should not sound uh, strange to you because it was what we obtained from the last chapter. Uh, we calculated using the Fourier transform formula. Now let's look at a uh, last example and then we will have a early release of this uh, lecture. Yeah, because the first half lecture is extended a little bit. So this signal, X of T defined over the entire time domain T, but it is zero everywhere else. Only when T is between zero and one, it is exponential minus T. So if you plot it, you'll find it is a truncated exponential signal. Calculate its Laplace transform using this standard formula and specify its region of convergence. So let's have three minutes for that. So let's calculate the Laplace transform using the standard formula. It should be the integration of from minus infinity to plus infinity. But since everywhere else x of t is zero, then we can limit the integral to zero and one on which region x of t equals exponential minus t. Exponential minus t, exponential minus st dt, so we have minus s minus one 
as the coefficient. They put it on the denominator, on the numerator, calculating the difference between upper and lower limit. So we put lower limit first, which is exponential zero that equals one, upper limit minus exponential minus s plus one times one actually. And because we put the lower limit first, so there is additional negative sign that cancels the negative sign in the denominator. That's why we change from minus one minus, minus s minus one to s plus one. And the ROC, actually all of s, but we need to be careful about the point s equals minus one, which will be discussed on the next slide. But indeed the ROC is is the entire complex plane, all of the S, because it does not involve any discussion of, or any condition of S for this calculation to hold. So we will leave the answer to this question to the next page. But let's first look at the ROC. Since it contains, since it is the entire complex plane, it contains the imaginary axis, real part of S equals zero, or equivalently S equals J omega. Therefore, its Fourier transform also exists. So the Fourier transform just replacing S with J omega. So capital X of J omega is one minus exponential minus one plus J omega, J omega plus one. So what happens when S equals minus one? We know that when S equals minus one, the denominator becomes zero. So we, in principle, we should now write it in this way, right? But we can take the limit of this expression when s goes to minus one. The limit means we are approaching it infinitely close, but we are not at this point. So we're taking the limit by taking the limit of access, taking the limit of this fraction. Because both the, the numerator and denominator, you will find that they both go to zero. In this case, we can apply the L'Hopital's rule, which says we can take the limit when both denominator and numerator are taking their integrals. The, uh, sorry, taking their derivatives. The derivative of the denominator with respect to S is just one. Uh, so I made a mistake here, actually. The, Oh, I, I made a mistake here. So I will re. Uh, so I will correct this slide. I will correct this slide and talk about it in the next lecture. Made a mistake when taking the integral, uh, taking the derivative. Okay. So, but if we want to look at the particular case as equals minus one, as equals minus one, not the limit, the x of minus one is this integral exponential minus t exponential t because it is x of s we are replacing s with minus one exponential minus s t becomes exponential t so these two terms gives us one so integration integral one dt is the length of the interval which is one but what i wanted to say is the limit as s goes to minus one equals the value when it is minus one. In other words, this expression x of s is continuous at s equals minus one. As we said in the chapter of Fourier transform, if such kind of continuity is true, then we can just write the answer with this uh, single case expression without further discussion. And this holds for all s, including x equals minus one. Yeah, but, but I need to correct this uh, de de derivation. Uh, I need to correct it. Okay. Uh, then on the Friday lecture, I will introduce a set of properties related to Laplace transform and their functions of those properties are, same, are the same to, the, to those for Fourier transform is for our convenience to obtain the new Laplace transform after certain transformation of original signals. 
Okay, uh, this is today's lecture. Uh, let's meet again on Friday. Thank you.